Welcome to this lecture on classical theory uh, and we trace its origins to classical Athens. Now, classical Athens is uh, generally regarded as a period between 507 to 400 BC. It was a democratic city state. There were three developments that profoundly influenced the nature of literature and criticism. So, what were these three developments? The first was the evolution of the polis or city state. Um, when Aristotle defined man as a political animal, it was this structure that he had in mind of city state, polis, the concept of democracy, etcetera. Even the internal structure of drama was influenced by the ideal of the polis. For example, the chorus, the chorus is generally regarded as um, the representative of uh, the community or polis, uh, whether it is a chorus in a group or a single choric character. It is clear that literature and poetry had a public and even political function which was largely educational. The second political development was the challenge posed by Sparta, which was the other major power in the Greek world. So, Athens and Sparta. The struggle between the two powers was political as well as ideological. Um, while Athens tried to establish their brand of democracy everywhere, Sparta tried to establish their own style of uh, government and uh, policy. The issues raised by the conflict between Athens and Sparta shaped uh, Plato's thoughts in many ways, including, including his literary theory. Now, this is what we are going to talk about today in classical theory, <coughs> Plato and Aristotle at the center. So, classical Athens we have already talked about period is between 507 to 400 BC, Plato. Now, Plato and Aristotle and their concepts, uh, especially Plato is associated with forms, poetry, representation, allegory of caves and then we will also talk about Aristotle, his theory of uh, mimes, mimesis and drama. Um, we will also be talking about Aristophanes comedy, the Greek playwright Aristophanes, his comedy the frogs and uh, uh, his uh, uh, the, the way the two great Greek uh, dramatists Aeschylus and Euripides make an appearance in the frogs and in, one co in what context. Um, so, um, we are talking about uh, the Greek police state, the conflict between the ideological political conflict between Athens and Sparta and let us talk about Pan-Hellenism, which was the third factor that shaped the evolution of literature in classical Greece. Now, Panhellenism is uh, Panhellenism is referred to um, as the development of certain uh, literary ideals and standards among the elites of the various city states of Greece. A major consequence of Panhellenism was the standardization of literature and literary ideals. It also led to the establishment of a certain group of uh, of canonical texts into the status of classics and uh, one uh, major uh, offshoot of Panhellenism was the development of the concept of imitation or mimesis into a concept of authority. So, all this uh, leads us to arrive at certain con conclusions what are these? So, the idea is that from the time, from the times of Homer, Homer uh, who wrote the immortal epics um, Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay, so, from the times of Homer, poetry had acquired 
an increasing authority and it has found its place into a canon of important texts. It has also acquired a prominent educational role. So, the assumption was that poetry presented a vision of the world, not just this world, but also the other world including the gods and also poetry influenced the ethics and morality that was true, that was believed to be true. Now, Plato's opposition to poetry sets the stage for subsequent literary theory and literary criticism. As you would know that uh, this vision that whatever poets and poetry represent is true, it has to be taken uh, at its face value. This idea, this notion was challenged by Plato and therefore, his we are interested in his theory of poetry which has come to um, set the stage, which has influenced uh, subsequent literary theory and literary criticism and thoughts. At this point, uh, I would like to introduce you to Aristophanes. Uh, and his comedy The Frogs. Now, the play relies, uh, by the way, the play was written in uh, 405 BC, and the play relies on the notion, on the assumption that poetry can produce an ethical effect. Uh, there is a, it is a, a, a wonderfully written, a wonderfully comic play uh, which discusses who is the greater playwright, the classic playwright Aeschylus or the more uh, according to those times the more recent Euripides. So, who is uh, the better, the greater of the two. So, um, the idea itself suggests that uh, the frogs dealt with the problems of making a literary judgment and uh, it sort of stages a contest between two literary theories as represented by two very distinct playwrights Aeschylus and Euripides. So, these two poets are competing here and uh, Aeschylus represents the more traditional values of uh, a bygone era, while Euripides is the voice of a new generation which is more democratic, more secular. The frog reveals that for the ancient Greeks, poetry was an important element in the educational process and its influence as I have already talked about extended over um, the moral thoughts, the morality, religion and the entire sphere of civic responsibility. So, poets and poetry had an important role to play in all these realms. Now, um, this was the significance attached to poetry and poets. Now, we come to Plato, Plato the great philosopher and thinker who lived between 428 to 347 BC. Now, Plato is widely believed to be the philosopher who laid the foundation of western philosophy. Um, it is often said that western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato who raised questions such as how can we define goodness and virtue? how do we arrive at truth and knowledge? So, these are the questions that Plato posited. Plato also asked what is the ideal political state and most importantly to what we are doing in relation to our cause of what use our literature and other arts. So, Plato was a disciple of Socrates, he came from an aristocratic family and at age 20 like many other young men of his times, he fell under the or he came under the spell of Socrates. After Socrates death, Plato founded 
an academy, academy with a with an uh, with a capital A in Athens. Now, most of Plato's uh, philosophy is expounded in dialogue form using a dialectical method of pursuing truth by a systematic questioning of received ideas and opinions. Now, some of the later dialogues that is Plato's uh, thoughts, they examine problems of an internal interrelations between the forms and here again forms with, an, with a capital F forms as well as examining questions of knowledge, science, happiness, uh, political uh, issues and also moral and religious issues. Now, one interesting thing about the dialogues is that uh, the figure of Socrates appears there and he seems to change from a representation of the historical Socrates in the early dialogues to a mouthpiece for Plato in the middle dialogues and later on he appears as a minor character um, in uh, the later dialogues. So, what are forms? Coming to forms, um, this is uh, the philosophy, uh, Plato's philosophy. Uh, in his so called middle period, which is based um, on uh, his uh, theory of forms. Plato tells us that knowledge is possible only if there are absolute and changeless objects of knowledge and these are forms or ideal realities such as justice itself, beauty itself and equality itself. So, the empirical world for Plato does not represent real knowledge. The appearance of things is continually changing. The observed world is not truly dependable as a source of knowledge. The only way to arrive at true knowledge is to apply the principles of pure reason in order to understand the world of the forms. This is illustrated in one of Plato's dialogues where Socrates leads a boy through a sequence of logical reasoning resulting in the boy understanding the problem. The purpose is to suggest that the boy has an intrinsic understanding of the problem, but is unable to use this until he is helped to do so by Socrates. Plato seems to conceive the forms as ideal exemplars that provide standards of judgment. By Plato's time, uh, it is important to note that the theatre had become the primary medium of poetry and it also included the components of epic as well as lyric. Tragedy too had come to acquire a very prominent position. Uh, it is also uh, at this point interesting to note Socrates uh, beliefs on poets and poetry and according to Socrates, um, a poet is a light and winged thing and holy and never able to compose until he has become inspired and beside himself and reason is no longer in him. So, uh, notice this, there is no reason, there is no rationality um, in poetry and in its creator. Uh, for Socrates, even literary criticism is irrational. Now, against all this background, uh, against uh, this kind of uh, historical background, you know, you have the you have the frogs uh, where uh, poetry is really given an exalted position, and then you have Socrates. And uh, where do we fit? Uh, Plato's concepts and theories of uh, poetry. So, uh, we have to understand that uh, Plato had written a number of great books um, uh, for the purpose of this course, for our specific purpose we are going to be concerned only with his The Republic which was uh, written in 360 BC. So, um, Plato's theory of poetry is largely included in the Republic. The main subject here is whether it is 
best to be just or unjust, especially since the letter, you know, the idea of being unjust seems to um, profit more or is it or uh, it is more profitable than the former. Now, in book 3 of the Republic, there is an exchange between Socrates and Edimentus. Edimentus is uh, Plato's uh, brother, his oldest brother and Plato starts by discussing stories of the gods and suggests that in the ideal city or republic, children should hear only good fables that poets compose and not the bad. They should not be exposed to the tales of how gods plot and fight because this will encourage them to behave in the same manner. So, uh, children according to Plato must learn that citizens should love one another and poets should set a model which obviously according to Plato they were not doing. So, for Plato the purpose of his stories is to implant virtue and uh, bravery is one such virtue. For Plato any poetry that weakens the warrior's nerve should be banned and these are the strong words. Uh, the idea is if um, a hero weeps at the death of a loved one, someone who is close to him, then young men would follow his example and moan freely without any shame, without inhibitions. So, uh, poet, the, uh, a poet has a responsibility in other words which he was not fulfilling and if that is not happening then poetry should be banned from the republic altogether. It is also interesting to note that uh, this is perhaps uh, one of the earliest examples of literary criticism and it is contained in a book which is uh, more about political theory, the republic. Um, continuing, Plato also mentions or uh, names different literary genres. So, uh, narrative is the first one where the poet tells a story in his own voice. Imitation, uh, this is tragedy and comedy and here for Plato the poet pretends that someone else is speaking, you see imitation and epic this is a mixture of narrative and imitation. So, these are the categories, these are the literary categories according to Plato. Plato then reflects over which form would be most beneficial to the well being of the republic. Now, this is important that uh, you know there should be some kind of um, of a use of poetry. Uh, it should not be uh, what later uh, we come to term as arts for art for art's sake. Okay, just it is a poetry and it is a beautiful work of art. So, it should be it should be uh, f uh, that was not the case according to Plato who believed that poetry should have a kind of uh, uh, responsibility and it should be for the well being of, um, of the people of the republic. So, in the ideal state, in the ideal city, individuals are trained to perform one particular function and if they are moved to imitate others by being exposed to poetry. Um, so, if they are moved to imitate others who perform different functions, then their expertise will disappear, it will vanish. So, that should not happen. For Plato, the poet cannot even imitate one thing well. Consequently, it is impossible for anyone to improve themselves by listening to poetry, particularly drama. So, Plato suggests that epic is more ethical than tragedy or comedy because it offers less opportunity for imitation as compared to drama. Now, Plato's greatest fear as he expresses in the Republic is that if poets are allowed to operate freely, they will 
produce inappropriate models. And this is important to note who, what are these inappropriate models. Mm, so, we have women, we have slaves and we have drunks and cowards. And uh, if people watch these people mm, playing certain roles, then people, the general public may be tempted to imitate these people who are very inferior models. Therefore, in order to avoid such an eventuality, banning all poets from the public is the only solution. And according to Plato, uh, there are very few high minded poets and except them all other should be banned or banished from the republic. So, um, this brings us to some very important key ideas that for Plato, um, poetry uh, performs uh, functions in two ways. First, it is a way of shaping public behavior and second, uh, it is a means of communicating knowledge. Plato concludes that uh, poetry neither improves nor enlightens us. I will repeat, uh, Plato concludes that poetry can neither improve nor enlighten us. The reason lies in poetry's mode of expression that is imitation. Plato argues that poetry is a poor copy of this world, which itself is a poor copy of a perfect world. So, copy of a copy, this is a very um, uh, important phrase from given to us by Plato and uh, several thousand years down the line we also come up, we keep coming across this particular phrase in several uh, contexts. Now, Plato's theory of poetry tells us that it cannot tell the truth because after all it is a, it is an imitation a copy of a copy and, but more importantly it Im includes a very new element into criticism which is how well poetry represents the world. So, therefore, I have highlighted this term representation, this is important. Uh, this brings me to Plato's very famous allegory that is his allegory of caves, where Plato likens, he compares people um, untutored in the theory of forms to uh, uh, he according to him these people who are, are not well versed in the theory of forms, they are like prisoners chained in a cave unable to turn their heads. All they can see is the wall of the cave and behind them burns a fire. Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a parapet along which puppeteers can walk. The puppeteers who are behind the prisoners hold up puppets that cast shadows on the wall of the cave. Now, the prisoners are unable to see these puppets, the real objects that pass behind them, what they actually see and here are the shadows and echoes cast by objects that they do not see. For Plato, such prisoners would mistake appearances for reality. They would think the things they see on the wall that is the shadows were real and they would re, uh, never know the real causes of the shadows. So, what is Plato trying to prove? The entire point is that the prisoners are mistaken uh, for they would be taking the terms in their language to refer to the shadows that pass before their eyes rather to the real things that cast the shadows. So, what actually uh, Plato is trying to do is to give us the concept of representation and imitation and all this leads us to um, a sustained discussion of mimesis, which we will be doing in our subsequent lectures. So, um, before we wind up for today, I would like to draw your attention 
to this particular assignment, please submit it by the deadline. So, this is what, um, these are the questions and I want you to post the answers. Name any one play by Euripides, we have already been introduced to Euripides. Also name any one play by Aeschylus. Third question, who wrote the play Oedipus? And the last question, mention any three works by Plato. Uh, you already know one work, The Republics, and I want uh, two more names. So, mention any three works by Plato. Thank you very much.